So we are now to our third and final panel on overcoming impediments, uh, culture, and the culture of innovation and risk. So we've got our panel coming up, and we're going to be moderated today by Ben Hafer from Civic Action, and he is formerly the CTO from Child Welfare and Digital Services, so he knows a little something about overcoming impediments on culture and innovation and risk. I'll kick it off to you. Oh, thank you, Adam. As everybody sits down, so yeah, final panel, so clearly the best, saving the best for last. Um, I have a, a distinguished panel, and actually I'm going to go a little off script today, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. So we'll start to my right with John. Oh. Uh, hello. <clears throat> hello, does this work? Good. Hi there, everyone. Um, thanks for sticking around. Uh, I'm John. I'm a computer guy. I worked in the private industry most of my life. Uh, and uh, 2016 changed that when I got a job at the US Digital Service. That was my first time ever working in government, and I found it very hard to go back since then. So um, you can find all the rest of me on LinkedIn and different companies I worked at. But since 2016, I've been in the White House. Then I went to uh, Code for America. Then I went to Civic Actions, where I am now. I worked on a bunch of local, state, and federal projects. And just in the trivia section, which may be interesting later, I've also written a book on how to work well and lead and manage distributed teams that are scattered. And I've also helped write a law on this. So you might have heard of the Vermont Remote Worker Law. Um, and there's others that are in progress, which I can talk about too. Thanks, John. Rob? So I'm Rob Klopp. Uh, I was also uh, early USDS, although um, uh, <clears throat> they sort of kicked me into the executive side of the things, which meant sort of out of USDS to some extent. And I was the CIO of the Social Security Administration. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we're, everybody's talking about, um, I was actually able to try to do, um, probably more successful than, uh, than you might think. Um, so uh, kind of I'm here to say all the stuff we're talking about can be done. I'll, I'll give you two quick facts about Social Security and then pass it on. Um, one is my IT budget was about $1.5 billion a year. So uh, we, could do, we can do this at scale. I mean, I don't know what the IT budget is at the state of California, but I can't imagine it's uh, order of magnitude different than that. Uh, but the other thing is um, that the checks that we mail out of Social Security Administration represents about 5% of the GDP of the country every week. So it's a, it's a very big organization. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of things that can be done. Hi, everyone. I'm Krista Kanalakis. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer in the city and county of San Francisco. And I lead an amazing team um, who are sitting there at the back, Natalie, Dee, and Jane. Um, and our vision is to make government more collaborative, inventive, and responsive. And we do that mostly through partnerships. So we see our greatest value in a city of over 30,000 employees. Um, and such a small team that the way that we can really deliver value um, at scale is by um, taking advantage of the great pool of talent in our city and sort of creating structured models of engagement for companies and startups and creative uh, folks in San Francisco to work side by side with our city staff. So that's sort of our model. Uh, I've been with the city for six years and was an entrepreneur before that. Great. Well, Krista, why don't you start us off with the first question, and that is, uh, traditionally, when envisioning new technology projects, there's a lengthy process to ramp up for an RFP. Due to its iterative nature, can you touch upon the advantages of going agile? Sure. Um, so I would I'd love to share just a story of um, what I think is one of the most successful agile projects in San Francisco, which is our affordable housing portal. So affordable housing is a big challenge, uh, I think, across the state, but especially in San Francisco. And um, at that, uh, when, uh, in, with our former Mayor Lee, he had a priority of how do we make it easier for people to search and find the affordable housing that is available in our city. 
Um, at that time, uh, there was no central place for residents to look for units. Basically, you had to go to each and every individual housing developer, sometimes each building, and each one had different eligibility requirements. And it was really just challenging for residents to navigate this whole system. Um, and so with the mayor kind of setting this as a, a priority for the city, um, we worked with that department who leads affordable housing, the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development, to um, initiate uh, uh, the, the building of, of a new tool. And at that time, um, they had had kind of plans to do a pretty traditional RFP. And we worked with their leadership to really make a case for, for doing it agile. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing um, at that time, the, the CFO, who obviously is the steward of uh, that department's budget, was a little skeptical of agile. Because you know, he saw the RFP that we were writing, and he was like, so I don't get to see anything that my money's going towards. Like, how do I? You know, he just felt this sense of risk um, in putting the money behind it. But then he, we sort of st started to realize that it actually, the process gave him more oversight over the spending of his money. There was an actual release within the first four months of the, um, of the of contracting the vendor. I also want to give a shout out to Roshan from Exigy, who was the vendor on that project. I think she's here somewhere. Um, and so just by getting results more quickly, the, it, we were able to kind of reduce that amount of uncertainty um, for them to spend the dollars. And then also I'll just add that um, there, by, by having this approach of putting the user first, it's also a community engagement strategy. So that department, um, they're the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development, and they you know, are constantly engaging with their community in different ways. And the, um, the head of community development for that department She's, she's, you know, he says, I know you have this new term, user research, but we call that community engagement, and we've been doing that a long time, and this is just a new form of applying it um, to kind of the development of a service. And so um, I think just sort of reframing some of the terminology even with Agile um, helped help to make that project uh, successful. Great. Anybody else have any insight on that? Yeah, so I... I um, I would say that, the, you know, the, the, the thing to do is skip the procurement and just get on with it. And I know that sounds sort of silly, but, but um, th you know, there was discussion earlier about, um, you know, code being the most important thing is one of the primary principles of Agile. And I think rightfully was pointed out that uh, it's not just code, it's high quality code that solves the business problem. But you know, the beauty of Agile is that, um, that y you know, you're, you can do things incrementally, including design. You don't have to spend a bunch of time up front getting everything all established because one of the fundamental principles of Agile is that you can't ever get that right anyway. So just get on with it. I can actually uh, show you writings by one of the original uh, lean development guys who would go so far as to say, that when you uh, start a project, if you could solve the first increment using a flat file, even if you know you're gonna use a relational database later, you should not implement a relational database up front. So these guys that invented Agile deny that you need to spend a bunch of time doing design. So I would say, just get on with it, get a backlog of user stories, and start collaborating with the developers and the users, and start writing code. And I think that if you, if you take that approach, um, and you get real life code that you're gonna end up with a better result than if you spend years mm -hmm. believing that you can uh, somehow think it all through up front. Yeah, um, as a computer guy, I, I've always been like, well, you know, I've done waterfall development and I did agile and did some other. Um, what I thought was most interesting was the organizational impact, which I sort of didn't think of at first, which is that you know, if you have to do a waterfall project, okay, it's going to take, let's say it's a five-year project, it's going to cost X amount of money, you're going to spend like a year or more doing all the paperwork to make sure you get it right before you start this thing. And because it's going to take a year of paperwork, it's going to take five years, then people want to start shoving in all these extra things. And I start calling it the kitchen sink project. It's like everything and everyone else has someone else that they want tacked onto it because it's going to take so long, there won't be another train coming. Let's get it all onto this thing. 
And the more you add on to it, the more complex it gets, the more stakeholders you got, the more risk that something's going to go totally sideways and derail the whole thing. And you won't know it'll five or ten years. And you know, we we all can point to examples that have been in the newspapers that are over budget, over time, and don't work. And they've got all these things tacked onto them. And to me, I think the organization has now built up this knowledge that this is a risky thing and it's going to be hard. And what I really like is if you do something small. I keep talking about baby steps. Like, take what is the smallest thing you could do that actually might people might care about, mm -hmm. but is so small that it's almost silly, but it's useful enough, but it proves that the different people involved can actually get something live in production. Even something as simple as like, what's the status of my application? Or how many people are in front of me in call line? Or can I text in and get a text response back? Like some of these things, it's not, that's not big, but could you do it, like you said, in four months on your thing? That's the kind of time frame. Could you go from talking about it to it's running live in production? And then can you do a fix into production to fix some problem that you discover that you didn't think? Like that is where you actually get people to start believing that change can happen and change can actually be good. And if something goes wrong, you can reduce the risk by quickly deploying a fix for whatever the problem was. Yeah, and, I'll and just I think that's, oh. that, that's the, like to me, that's the big thing. All the terminology and the religious wars I don't care about, but it's the organization getting trust that all the stakeholders can work together and make a difference quickly, it actually reduces risk. You can tell if it goes off the tracks and you can stop it. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add that there was an interesting moment before we issued the RFP, actually, where we were talking with someone, um, a, kind of a policy person, a senior policy person in the mayor's office, and we were saying, okay, we want to do, um, when we were building this tool, we need, we need to get everyone to start using it, all the developers, all these different nonprofits, um, people that we don't necessarily have the authority over. Um, to use this new system. And this um, policy person said, okay, well, why don't we just pass a law that requires them to use this system? And we're like, well, you know, we, we could do that, but let's actually just try and build something that they want to use. Right. Let's start there. <laughs> um, Carrot versus stick. <laughs> yeah, and so, and, and by um, having, like, just, we were basically like, just give us a shot. Um, to try this new approach, see how it goes. And then we obviously, we built, the, it's a beautiful tool. Um, and, and so we didn't, wasn't required to sort of take that kind of blunt measure. So I'd like to sort of say something a little bit different and see what the reaction is actually on both sides of me. And that is, you know, one of the problems that we have in government is that uh, uh, oftentimes um, we're, the hand that we're dealt is that we have a legacy system that's 30 or 40 years old at Social Security Administration. The systems we had ran on 60 million lines of COBOL and 7 million lines of assembler language. And these are really old batch-oriented systems. And the fact is that you can't build a modern system in four months on top of that that adds any value because you have this core infrastructure that's just fundamentally not modern. You can't build a modern real-time, uh, uh, citizen-facing thing that actually does stuff in, in real-time because the fundamental infrastructure you're building on top of is batch that expects nothing to happen except overnight. And so, so while I appreciate the uh, why you say, oh, let's just go do little things in four months, mm -hmm. the fact is that sometimes in government, you have to start with really, really big things you have to fundamentally modernize this core, the core capabilities so that you can add four-month things on top in four-month agile increments, but, but you can only do that after the foundation is modernized. So in government, I think we have to be careful about the, the in, in big government, federal government and maybe state government, I think we have to be a little bit careful about just jumping into, oh, it's so easy that we're going to do little four-month things that are going to add real-life value. I think that there are opportunities to do that. Mm -hmm. and we should always look for those opportunities and take them. But we need to understand that there's a much bigger fundamental problem that probably has to be solved. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Like every one of the projects I've been involved with, they do involve, at some point, you're trying to make, in a lot of time, cases, the computer systems that have been running live in production since before my parents met which I always think is a, 
disturbing metric. And, <laughs> and, and I was about to say I don't tell them that, but I just realized we're on camera, so uh, I will have some phone calls later. Um, and, and the consequence of that is that the humans who know how those systems work are not around. And so you get some, here's a binder that's like four inches thick, and it's, this is the reference manual that tells you everything about this giant box that's running in a corner. You may or may not have an accurate copy of the source code. Even if you read this whole thing, you don't really know what you're dealing with. It's like a box of surprises all the way down. And I can have all sorts of whiteboard sessions and planning meetings and stuff. I won't know till I touch it what happens. And so the only way I can actually do that is with these small little experiments. And I don't do, mean it as like, oh, this, I'll just replace this, you know, pick your giant legacy hardware system vendor of choice. I'm not inserting any names. So, uh, I'm just gonna replace this with something running on a hosted cloud environment with another vendor name I'm not gonna say. Um, and I'll do it in four months. No, it's like a huge thing. You, it's gonna be like an archeology span project as well as other things. But you gotta start somewhere and I think getting out of the, it's easy to sit around a table and have people talking and getting around the, can we actually deploy any code onto anything that will connect to that existing thing and get us back a proof of life? And if the answer is no, well then we've got a bigger problem. Like, it doesn't matter what else we do. If the answer is yes, okay, and we at least know that path works. And that to me, that's where I start. But it's, a, it's the beginning of a, a, like a journey, to use a cliche someone else said earlier. It's like, you're gonna be doing a sequence of these. That would be my. So, so I'll just say real quick, uh, having, you know, thrown cold water on the whole, let's just do things in, that are valuable in four mm -hmm. months. The thing I'll say is that um, <clears throat> if you've spent time in Silicon Valley and you've spent time dealing with venture capitalists and you've, and you've actually gone to venture capitalists and asked for money to build a software product, the thing that you realize is that there's no such thing as a $100 million software development project in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Not a, there is no such thing as a $100 million project. The total amount of money that Facebook spent in software development at the time they went public with a billion mm -hmm. concurrent users is $50 million. Mm -hmm. So rebuilding uh, Medi-Cal's Camus infrastructure is probably a $50 million problem or a $40 million problem. It's not a billion dollar problem, which is what people think. So even though I believe that we have to start by redoing these foundations, you need to understand that using modern software engineering today, that is probably a $50 million problem. It's certainly not a $500 million problem. And we're off, oftentimes by orders of magnitude when we think about these things in government because we're used to it being a $500 million problem that becomes a $1.5 billion problem after we blow it up and screw it around and mess it up, right? So think about the, prob the big problems as being $50 million problems, and all of a sudden this idea of actually going in and starting by modernizing the foundation starts to make a lot more sense. Well, and I would just add that that pain, that, or that challenge that you identified is, I think, something that cities really feel acutely because we're often required to work with um, state systems that we don't have any control over, and so we're by nature required to actually do, f figure out um, ways of um, improving services with those legacy systems. And so um, I can share an example of that, but uh, we basically, uh, we have a program where we bring in startups and they um, work with our different city departments on big challenges that the city's facing. One of them was um, our human services agency um, wanted to make it easier for people to um, uh, recruit foster parents. And so we were required to use this, this large state system, um, but we were able to really uh, find a startup that was able to um, integrate with that system. And so while we shouldn't stop those big systems from being changed, there are still ways to sort of um, yeah. find um, iterative, Absolutely. more uh, yeah. agile ways of, of There is low-hanging fruit. Yes. Yeah, right. And that, that low-hanging fruit, like that particular project, that's all, oh, sorry, that, that particular low-hanging fruit, that particular project, every one of them builds trust with all the people involved. Like, oh, we actually got something to work hey, we could try something else now, right? And to me, that's the, like, you can't replace the entire thing in one shot, 
uh, with that kind of build trust thing, because so many projects go sideways, because you get surprised on the way. But you can actually build trust with the team to start things going. And I think that's a huge, huge thing. You'll need that trust later on when you do hit a real surprise and everything does go sideways. And you're like, well, at least we all trust and work together. We've got five things out the door in a row. This sixth one was a bear, and I, I, that's my... And that one company that started that one pilot in San Francisco now is serving 60% of California market yeah. in, for that particular service by right. just testing, testing it in one environment and then having the, the agency directors of the equivalent in different counties recommend to other counties to buy that solution. So mm -hmm. it can work. Yeah. Great. Well, with that shift to agile, um, I think one of the biggest impediments that we face here in the state especially is um, for lack of a better term, and I think most people agree with me, is uh, our, our control agency oversight. Uh, how does one shift from a waterfall methodology of being able to track a specific requirement or schedule, and now we're, we're trying to pick and choose these small little things and try to find success. So how do you, how do you um, interact with control agencies when you're making the shift to Agile? So, so I'll jump on that one. Um, so first off, it's really hard because the control agencies have been doing this for a long time and their view of the world is, uh, you're gonna give me a waterfall project plan, the project plan is gonna say, you know, uh, six months, three days, and 23 hours from now, you're gonna deliver the following features, and if you haven't delivered them, then I'm gonna start beating you up, that's what my job is, is oversight. And I think that Agile is a fundamentally different project uh, process, and, and, and it, I mean, it, it's sort of hard to talk about the whole process and the time frame we have, but the thing to think about is that, that in Agile, you're going to basically be delivering uh, significant, you're gonna be delivering functionality every two weeks, but a significant product increment maybe every two or three months. And really what you do is you need to make a promise to the oversight people that say that, um, that you can count on me delivering an increment that in two months that does this, trust me to do that in two months, and I'm gonna give you a view as to what's two months beyond that and a view of what's two months beyond that. But where Agile comes is the second product increment. I might actually change the user stories because priorities change or new ideas or something like came in, but I probably change it five or 10%, not 50%. And you build trust in two month increments by saying in the next two months I'm gonna deliver something and delivering it. In the next two months saying now I'm gonna deliver the next thing next two months I'm gonna deliver the next thing. And the oversight agencies cut you off when you violate the trust. What John said about trust is it's fundamental to Agile. The oversight agencies have got a trust that you're doing, uh, you're gonna do what you say, and you have to go deliver on that trust every two months. And every time you deliver on it, you earn more trust and it just, the process is sort of you know, natural and goes in a really nice way. The other thing I think that's really important is that be, the point of Agile is the next two-month increment might change some. The two-month increment beyond that might change even more. That is what Agile is. A new user story popped up. A new legislative mandate came in and, and changed the user stories fundamentally. You just dynamically make those adjustments every two months. What you don't do is say, no, 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 wait. I'm managing this as an oversight agency based upon a contractual relationship with a vendor, so let's stop and go into change management mode where we completely renegotiate the contract. You just put the new user stories in the backlog, prioritize them into the next increment, and move forward. So all of the stuff that we contractually are used to dealing with that says, wait, if you change anything, it impacts the contract, so we're gonna go back to contract management, um, change management is natural and organic and agile, and you just make the changes and move on. It may mean that you don't, at the, in six months and 23 hours and some odd minutes, deliver exactly the features you said you were gonna deliver in the first place, but you're delivering value every step of the way, and, and it's delivering value is kind of what it's all about. Okay. Um, uh, Another spin on that that I would put in is, uh, I, I think you, you earn trust, right? I think that's one part of it. But there are people there whose job is to make sure that you're actually doing the thing you said you're doing. And that's good because there's a history and a track record of, you know, people make jokes about uh, 
or people in government are cynical. It's like, well, they've got you know a, a right to. They've had decades of people selling them stuff. It doesn't work. It comes in late, and it, you know, sometimes it works, but many times it doesn't. So like, I would be cynical, right? And it's like. So yes, you have people you've got to verify, and they don't know you, so they got, you've got to build trust, and you've got to verify the trust. And one of the things I found was interesting, and it is a culture change, because like, you're doing things in a very, very different way. So one of the things I found interesting is how you, like, instead of trying to hold people at arm's length, to go talk to them. Like, what can I show you? I've got all these weird spinning plates and systems running over here. What can I show you that would help you automatically see the answers you want? So instead of saying, oh, can you send me a report every Friday that does X? I'd be like, what if I could set up an automated query on our ticketing system that would give you a list of all the things that we've touched? Or what if I could give you a list of, automatically give you a list of all the code changes we've made in the last 24 hours? Not just a, a nice text file dumped into Excel, but actually a link to where the, the Git repos are, where you can actually see the lines of change. Or what if I could, you're worried about SSL certificate encryption things. Okay, what if we put up some automated scans and we give you a report of that? So they could actually see it's dynamic and live and they can also then look themselves without having to come and ask me for a meeting about it. That self-enabling them is massive. Like that's a, 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 first of all, it builds trust. It helps them verify what I'm doing. Also, it cuts down a lot of busy work that people have to do. It just makes them, everyone be able to get stuff done. So just asking what people want helps. That's my, yep. and I, you. So I'll just be real quick. So yeah. it's really important. Um, the uh, Adams agency is actually doing some really interesting work now where they're talking about a modern development environment. Modern development environment, a lot of other people call it continuous integration or DevOps. But in a modern development environment, every time you check in code, uh, it can be reported in the ways that John was described. So you know the status is, this user story is progressing, code is being checked in. By the way, you also automatically check in automated unit tests, and you trigger those unit tests um, every time the code is checked in. So you know not only that code is being checked in, but the code is passing the unit tests. Yeah, it's so working. it's high, high quality code. Um, you even check in automated acceptance tests so you know that the code is, is passing acceptance tests every time it's checked in. And so the idea is that, that instead of um, the oversight agencies being in a really difficult position where they go to the development team or the vendor every month and say, what's the status? And they get back a PowerPoint with a bunch of green boxes on it. That's, that somehow are green right up until the day they turn red and they never turn yellow, right? <laughs> the reality is if you have a development environment that basically um, is accurately and automatically measuring exactly what progress is, all of that goes away and that builds trust as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm right with you. Yeah, yeah I think just adding to John and Rob, I, I really think trust is the currency in government. So. You know, it's not money, it's not ideas necessarily. I really think it's trust because when you're trusted, you're given real problems to work on, you're uh, allowed to take risk, you're, you know, um, given resources, all of those things. And um, the amount, I really think that the amount that you're able to innovate is sort of directly proportional to the amount you as an individual and you and your team um, have been able to engender trust um, in your organization. And trust me, having the word innovation in your job title doesn't help with that. Um, and so th really thinking through um, your own, one's own sort of self-orientation in a situation and what, other in what others' incentives are. I'm really trying to understand what is driving everyone on this project to kind of understand um, how do you build trust with these different stakeholders. Yeah, sorry, can I yeah. riff on the trust thing again? Several of the projects I've worked on, so this is both city and state and federal. Um, behind the scenes, there's some system running away, it's, and again, it's a really old system, and there's maybe one or two people still around who knew everything about how it works. Some of these people have stayed there, like one particular case, I know someone who stayed there beyond his retirement, specifically so that, because he knew no one else knew how to make it work. And he'd been doing this thing for decades. And he was terrified when this bunch of, you know, hip Silicon Valley kids showed up and they were gonna show him in four weeks how to do a 
something running on a phone and it'll be perfect. And he's like, what are you going to do? You're going to break everything. I've been trying to hold this thing from falling apart for decades. Don't break it, please. Um, and it was about building trust. I had to sit down and show him like, how to log into some cloud products and like, how to like, stand up a, a database on an EC2 instance and running some RTS and just like, breeze. And he's like, oh, this is this would have taken him a year of paperwork to stand up a database that I had running in 30 seconds. And then I sat down and we spent days just going through like how to use Amazon Console. Like simple, you know, simple stuff that had never been shown to him before. And also, every time we did something, I always asked about what do we what could possibly go wrong? And he's like, oh, you could blow up the database. Okay, what do we is there a way I could like not blow up the database? Like, can we get a read-only copy? Can you give me a copy of one of the recent backups and I can play with that over here somewhere else? And then then I can't break anything. And so being aware of and very, very sensitive to what are the risks that other people are trying to hold careful mm -hmm. containment on, that's a huge part of the job. And that's, as soon as you start doing that and actually really respecting it, that's when you start getting trust. And that's when people start showing, well, you think that's scary. Here's this other thing that's even scarier. We don't know what to do with this other system. Can you help with that too? And you're like, oh God, what? What's that? <laughs> um, and that's, that's, that's part of the job. You know, it's, it's, it's the humans, not the technology. Well, speaking of humans, uh, as, you, oh. as you mentioned, John, um, you recently wrote a book. Oh, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a question to you, but please, I want the panel to, to weigh in, is yeah. are distributed teams risky? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hiring and working with other people is risky. Um, <laughs> working by yourself is also risky for different reasons, but hiring and working with other people is risky. And, you know, the usual thing, the usual question is how do you know people are working? And that's the usual first question. And... Uh, to which I'd ask, well, okay, if they're in the office sitting at a chair for nine hours a day, having gone through two nice commutes to get in and out of the office every day, how do you know they're working in the office? You know, uh, just because someone's sitting typing, if you walk around an open plan office, you'll notice most people tilt their monitors and stuff, so you can't, people walking by can't see what's on the screen. So like, are you really working hard on that end of quarter report? Are you on Facebook? Are you on Amazon? Are you like, you know, what are you doing? Um, and and so that you know the same is true if you're at home. Like if I'm at home or if I'm in a co-working center, how do you know what I'm doing? And the actual ans answer I think is to know: Did you do anything? Like what's the output? Show me what you did. And if you didn't do anything, like you didn't write any code, you didn't write a report, you didn't, you've got no nothing to show for what you've been doing for the last eight hours, maybe it's a busy day, or maybe you've got a lot going on. But if you have nothing to show for what you've done for the last six weeks, that's a problem, even if you're in an office or not. Um, to the other side of it, I think the, uh, the other thing that comes up with distributed teams that's an interesting one is, apart from the physical location piece, it's easy to not have people talking to each other, which means you don't, back to trust, you don't get to trust your coworkers. And so you get companies that say, oh, we're fully distributed, or you know, we have people in different locations. We only talk to them about work. We don't know anything about their personal lives. They don't know anything about us, which means they don't get to know us as humans. We don't get to trust each other. So then if something goes wrong, you, you phrase something incorrectly in an email, or you say something that might be a little terse, or someone says something in a, in a conference call or a video call, people can just go ballistic. And it goes totally out of context. And if it was with someone you know and trust, you'd be like, oh, God, that Rob guy, he's always like that. You know, whatever, it's fine. You know, But because you know each other, right? But if you don't know each other, you'd be like, hey, what, what the hell? How do you know that I'm Turks? <laughs> <laughs> In here. <laughs> so um, that, that trust, so you have to focus on, you know, if you have an office environment, people will actually have casual conversations. If you have a distributed team, you have to construct those com social interactions in a premeditated way. Um, and there are many, many companies that have been doing this for several years, just fine. I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> so, so, so I think that there's, um, there's certainly a risk in having distributed teams. I think that there's collaborative tools that um, mm -hmm. make it easier than it used to be, but I don't think it makes the problem that John described go away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a particular 
problem with distributed teams and Agile, which is that, uh, you know, we talk about user stories, but it's not a story at all. It's one sentence, right? I mean, it's not a requirements document that you can get this thing and, and go write code and never talk to another human being because everything is laid out in the requirements document. A user story is more of a reminder. They need to go talk to a real life end user and figure out exactly what they really want. And that interaction between the developer and the user is uh, complicated if they're distributed, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think that th I think that there's um, I think that uh, in a perfect world you would never have a distributed team. You would always have that face-to-face -face interaction. However, the other side of the coin is that um, uh, uh, you know probably we have all once upon a time in our life run into that developer that could write uh, 40 times more code, good, high quality, beautiful code a day than any other developer. And if that developer was remote, you might say, uh, you know, maybe I'd be okay with those people being distributed. So that's kind of a shorthand way of saying that you probably produce better results with a distributed team of extremely skilled people than with a face-to-face -face team of people that might be not so skilled. But the best solution is to have the best people face to face with your end users, not not also face to face with each other. But but developers can figure out how to collaborate, you know, using Slack and stuff like that without too much trouble. The real problem, I think, is the interface between the developer and the business person, who really is the one who who needs to say, "This is what I need you to do." No. And <laughs> and I, I would just add that you can have, you know, there's a yes and no's to that. Like, if you have some people who are like, oh, we're going to put all the developers in a little cluster in a room over here, in wherever that is, that's assuming that they all live near there, and there's a whole bunch of research that's in the book, actually, um, that uh, people are moving less. People, the United States used to have a very highly mobile population. They moved around places. People would move for a job and live there, and then maybe move for another. That mobility rate has dropped. People's average tenure in dro jobs has dropped. No one has a job for life anymore. That, that's just a thing. Except in some government circles, it does happen. But in the private industry, it doesn't and hasn't. The average tenure in the computer industry is now under two years in a job. And if you're a double-income family, who moves and who gives up the job when you move, like that scenario? Um, and also, if you put everyone in one place, hypothetically, say, for exa example, Sacramento, just to pick this, how do you know if this is accurate for what's going on with the users in another place, somewhere else in California? Do you, like, do a road trip and go around, or do you actually have people who are based in each of these places who all work together? And that, that's actually an important part of it. And I'll just add a note, the final note, there's actually a huge diversity impact here as well. If you require people to commute to an office and then back, that only works for people who can see and who can drive and who are physically able. I've worked with many people who are visually impaired, who are in wheelchairs, as well as caregivers who can't be more than 10 minutes away from a school or a parent's house. And if the office is 30 minutes away, they won't even apply for the job, no matter how good they are, no matter how much you would love them, because of just physical commute. So this is, this is a real, actual hiring retention problem. And it's, that matters. If you have empty seats instead of a full team of developers, if you only have half a team of developers and a bunch of empty seats, that's going to impact your productivity like heck. Yeah. I see Bill is loitering there. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so we have some time for questions. Um. I guess I'm, I'm coming from the spot that uh, I see some good work being done technically within state government by staff. And I, I'd like to hear your discussion as to whether you would like to work with uh, in house programmers and uh, system architects and kind of what uh, the ideal structure would be for contracting and in-house uh, work. 
Let me take that first. So, so unknown to most of you guys, I actually started my career in the state of California as a uh, student assisted and tabulating machine operator. And uh, I left the state in, uh, in uh, 1980 as a system software specialist three at Teal Data Center. In 1980, I was part of a team at Teal where they, where IBM actually brought in the operating MVS at that time, now Zeos, operating system development team to work with us because we were building things, uh, user modifications to the operating system that nobody in the world was doing and IBM wanted to embed those things in and did into the operating system. And the reason I tell you that story is because in 1980, the ability of the state of California's technical staff to go solve technical problems was as good as any company in the world. Mm -hmm. The state of California's technical people were as good as anybody in the world, and I don't think anybody would say that's the case now. So I would answer that question by saying that the state of California is not going to succeed with IT until they develop an in-house capability of that, of that same uh, skill set until there is a set of thousand developers in Sacramento or if we're distributed not in Sacramento <laughs> a thousand developers that are as good as anybody in Silicon Valley then we're not going to be successful with IT until we have developers that can be partners to the contractors that we bring in um, as opposed to just sort of administering the contractors that come in, I think that this thing is not ever going to uh, straighten up and fly right. So, you know, if I was king, I would try to make a giant investment in the st state IT staff in order to develop that skill set. Uh, I just don't see how it's going to fly any other way. <laughs> and, and I would love to call out um, Carrie Bishop, our Chief Digital Services Officer, who's back there, who leads our in-house um, design and development shop within San Francisco, um, who is, is really our um, expert and center of excellence in the city around user research and user-centered design and really working with departments on building new digital services. And um, to your question specifically around sort of the model and the structure, I could just go back to the, um, the model that we did with this affordable housing portal, which um, I think is a good example as a precedent for how to kind of introduce um, uh, agile and user-centered design into government. And how it started was um, essentially um, we had a, a pro bono team from Google come in and do, for four months, did some rapid prototyping and design sprints with that department and really coached them through how to understand their user and what, um, what might be possible with a new tool. They did, uh, you know, secret shopping and actually tried to apply for affordable housing, which was uh, an interesting process in itself. Um, and then um, they hired, as I mentioned, a vendor who's um, Exigy, who's you know an expert in Agile. And through that process, where you know um, Exigy was really coaching that department in how to do Agile and building some in-house expertise there on how to manage a vendor. But really, the I think one of the biggest impacts of that engagement was that um, it really started to build uh, the use case, uh, or sorry, build the business case for um, how technology and design can really help that department um, serve its residents better and um, has been so successful to the extent that now that team, the, that department, is actually hiring people on um, the digital services team in San Francisco that are specifically focused on housing. So it went from um, basically a very traditional RFP approach to bringing in some pro bono resources to sort of try, shake things up and try it differently, to hiring a vendor that was really coaching them, and now for them really investing in staff to, to specifically um, focus on building out technology to serve residents. So you can sort of see that evolution within that department of starting small, but then, you know, towards to, do, to today where they're actually fully invested in the, the in staffing up um, around service design and, and technology. Hmm. And that's a great story. That's spot on with what Ann was saying earlier about bringing in outside people to kind of trigger the cultural change. Hmm. 
And, and I'll, I'll add, I, when I worked at CWDS, I like a, a blended model. Um, when you're working with new agile methodologies that are, that are new in the state for people that, on, on projects that aren't used to that, human-centered design, um, you're working you know, user stories, and, and it's just a completely different way of thinking, it was difficult to find state staff that could meet those requirements. And so classifications were actually a big issue because it was hard to write a duty statement for something that didn't exist. So what we tried to do was find people that were willing to learn. And when you do that and you pair them with a vendor team, they're learning and they're growing, but you have to be prepared to let them go because they're not gonna be around much, much longer. They're gonna take what they learn and they're gonna take it to another project or maybe even the private sector and that's fine. But you have to understand that up front and it's okay. I mean, one of the, my biggest success is that I would judge myself against is how many people did, uh, you know, moved on to another project on my team because that made them successful. Um, but continue that, and we, at CWDS we even had an innovation lab on the first floor. And part of it was learning and having a safe space to go in and try something new. And we actually brought in other projects and other departments to come in at the same time. So these are opportunities for growth and, and, mm -hmm. and, and evolution. Um, but you can't try to hold people <laughs> uh, on your project, so you gotta let them go. Hey, Salaries hey ben, we, we've or, got yeah, time for another question. Okay, we can talk after. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for this last bit of discussion because I was about to complain about how we were so user-centered focused in the earlier part of the day, and then that was not discussed at all in the in, the, in your panel prior to this uh, question or discussion that happened. So, thank you for that. Uh, my question is still about design and how um, I think a lot of us who have uh, tried to work with agile methodologies over and over again experience that design is half thought wedged in at the end somehow because fundamentally um, uh, agile processes didn't originally create a space for that. So there's always like how do we marry lean design with agile and it's we rarely get that seat at the table early enough in mm. planning and strategy to actually provide the service design that we intend to. And I'm wondering if you've had projects where you've been able to reorient so that um, design is no longer thought of as the people you talk to after you've built your prototype that doesn't work very well. Thank you. Um, I'll speak to one, I don't know how to, um, one at least project I was on where um, yeah, we had some UX people literally working with end users in this case for this particular agency. Um, and they, uh, they came up back with some ideas. <clears throat> we did some prototyping and mock-ups and things like that. But part of that was interact. When I say end users, I mean this, part of this is the private citizens who want to interact with the agency. And other end users are actually employees of that agency who have to interact on the other side of the curtain, working on the systems on the other side. And what we found when we started going through this process of what seemed like a simple enough small baby step thing was that actually the process for dealing with this particular appeal situation. Aha. Uh -huh. OK. OK, thank you. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, the process for dealing with this particular situation where an end, uh, a citizen comes to the front door of an agency and says, hey, I'm, I'd like to do X on the inside, and uh, a federal, in this case, a federal employee says, like, oh, OK, I, I take it from here and I go to here. It turns out that process was actually internally in that agency. That process was not known. It was folklore. And it turns out that. Um, agency employee number one would do the steps they had always done because that's what they learned from their boss when they joined. And they handed it over then the counter to another agency, or another department in the same agency, who followed their folklore. And you, we actually tried to draw flowcharts of where things would go just on this very simple case. Um, and we ended up with this hugely complicated graph that nobody could make sense of. And then it turns out when we went back and asked people, every one of these different federal employees had different ideas of what the other teams were doing. And it turns out we found a bunch of applications that were stuck in places because group one would put the applications over here, and group two had stopped picking them up from here about 10 years ago. Yeah. And so how did we get the opportunity to uh, Because we actually started shadowing along with the application. Um, is that what, I'm not sure if I so, followed the question. Let me try. A lot of uh, these or a lot of organizations really, you know, decide to go agile. They get stuck on ceremonies. Uh, and oh, yeah. Yeah. They're not thinking at that higher level. Like, oh, wait a second. How do, we, how do we really provide and show value? And, you know, service design and UX solves so many of those problems where we're asking for the trust. Mm -hmm.
to actual requirements. Sorry. Um, I don't know if you heard any of that. Um, I heard most okay, of it, yeah. Hear it. Trying to project. Um, so, uh, you know, we just have a constant challenge of, of how do we introduce uh, service design as this larger thing than, like, design where we're kind of thinking about other things other than your interface and get to that higher level, that, that seat at the bigger table or maybe smaller table as we go up so that we can um, actually provide the value that we can, uh, that we know that we can, and we can solve these problems that we're not being asked about, which is the, which is the problem. So, yeah. so I think that there's a, a natural tension between agile and architecture. And by natural tension, I really mean there's tension and the tension's a, you know, a good thing. But, but um, the idea that uh, some group of people should sit around before anybody starts writing code and design all the services or or design all of the data architecture and all that kind of stuff down to the entity and attribute level that's that's just not agile and s okay so what when so, you so I, I apologize i hate to do this but okay. we're we're going to we're going to take the dialogue into a different format now but okay. first i i want to i want to thank the panel for their insights <laughs>